Good morning, everybody. Hello. Happy Sunday morning. <laughs> the bright, relentless Colorado sun is out today, and it's going to be a nice warm one before we get some more snow later. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. I know you really came here for weather, <laughs> but those of you who I've lived in a lot of places that were very weather centric, like um, West Texas with all of the kind of tornado warnings and Oklahoma. I've lived in almost every single tornado alley in the United States. And um, I have very early memories of living in Arkansas, especially Arkansas and Ohio. Um, and spending like nights underneath a mattress pulled into the hall of our home. Um, my brothers and I would sit there and read or play games or be bored waiting, f waiting for the tornado warning to go away because it was coming down for us. I have never been in a tornado, knock on wood. Um, but yeah. So good morning. Hi, I'm sorry I was a little late. I had to plug in my phone and some last minute stuff that I didn't think I would have to do. Um, I'm nice and coffeeed up today, so who knows what's gonna come out of my brain. I have a couple of things to, to talk about and I think so. So how are you? I would love to hear how you are even if it's crappy. I saw something, one of those lists where Europeans or not even Europeans, just people who aren't Americans, the things that we do that are kind of strange to them. And saying, how are you, is one of them. But I really mean it. How you doing? comments if you'd like or just check in with yourself okay so we are going to start with our invocation and as I usually do um, in the grand tradition of holy texts <laughs> um, I just open this book and I usually go for what is right there. Just like I used to in church when I would let the Bible fall open and try to find something from God in those words. We'll have to do that sometime for an exercise, okay? I'm trying to think if I have... I might have a Bible. I'll have a big old Bible. Maybe we'll do that today. So, good morning. Um, the invocation is from this book, Earth Prayers from Around the World, and it fits. It fits our needs. Okay. Blessed be the wind. Blessed be the wind. Without wind, most of Earth would be uninhabitable. The tropics would grow so unbearably hot that nothing could live there, and the rest of the planet would freeze. Good morning, Joe Carroll. This started with, blessed be the wind. Without wind, most of Earth would be uninhabitable. The tropics would grow so unbearably hot that nothing could live there and the rest of the planet would freeze. Moisture, if any existed, would be confined to the oceans and all but the fringe of the great continents would be desert. There would be no erosion, no soil, 
and for any community that managed to evolve despite these rigors, no relief from suffocation by their own waste products. But with the wind, earth comes truly alive. Winds provide the circulatory and nervous systems of the planet, sharing out energy and information, distributing both warmth and awareness, making something out of nothing. All wind's properties are borrowed. Our knowledge of it comes at second hand, but it comes strongly. And this combination of a force that cannot be apprehended, but nevertheless has an undeniable existence, was our first experience of the spiritual. A crack in the cosmos that widened to let the tide of consciousness flow through. We are the fruits of the wind and have been seeded, irrigated, and cultivated by its craft. Oh, by Lyle Wilson, uh, sorry, Lyle Watson. Dang, I could talk the whole time on this. Whew. This feels a little bit more impactful because in Colorado, I mean, and it's the same in kind of the, the plain states as well, the wind can be relentless. Like, maybe it's not quite at the level of Oklahoma wind. When I went to college, um, there was this one spot on campus, um, it was in Oklahoma City, and there was this one spot on campus where the buildings were oriented um, and spaced such that when those Oklahoma tornado kinds of winds came in, man, it would just blow you over because it funneled the wind perfectly and it was already, you know, 60 mile an hour gusts, but then you get up, you get it funneled and it was more. And here in Colorado, we're kind of entering a more, a windier time. Spring is blustery and um, we have, we have high winds predicted for this, for this week. And when I'm driving my little car on the highway, um, you know, I was driving with a friend the other day and we were trying to get someplace fast. And if you ever need to get anywhere fast on the highway, if there's no weather, ice or snow, I'm your gal. Call me up. I'll get you there. <laughs> I'll get you there. But she was like, I said, it's really windy. Oh, say hi to Max. I said, it's really windy. And she was like, oh, oh, I'm so glad it's windy because I thought you were just swerving for no reason. I mean, it's, it's just, it can be really harsh. But to think of it as the circulatory and nervous system of, I would say circulatory, system of the earth and everything in this invocation is true. It's going to make me think of it differently this week. I'm going to think about the blessing of the wind. I might read that at the end of today too, because I'm going to think about it because I get a lot of like anxiety with the wind as well. It seems to stir things up and, and maybe that's the point right? Maybe I need to be stirred up. I mean, if there's anything that's going to stir us up, it's a, it's a worldwide pandemic. Hmm. I'm thinking a lot of thoughts that, um, I, that are very uncomfortable and that I've been thinking about a lot. So we have the blessing of the wind, the thing that roils and disturbs and blows over and, really creates, can create chaos, but it also brings life, right? And I've been, I've been, uh, boy, how to say this, it's, it's like a lot. Um, I'm not going to go into it today, but I had some like early trauma 
not really, not abuse, but some tra a traumatic event, like when I was very young. And the, what happened is that in order to cope, my analytical brain um, took over because it was too hard to feel. And if you've known me for a while, if I've known you for a while, you know that I am a feeling person and I, I like people, but it really did take me a long time to come to that. I, I found solace and comfort and, um, and love and relationship in my relationships with books for most of my life until a few years ago, really, um, maybe a decade. And, and maybe more, but, but I didn't really deal with the, the trauma. Um, and I've always been a very analytical person right along with being creative. And a lot of my creativity comes from just seeking symmetry. And, and so my analyst, my, an, my inner analyst is super buff, man. <laughs> like, he's like a crossfitter. My inner analyst is a crossfitter. There talks about it, everything, brain, brain, brain. This is my brain. And I've been learning to just dial him down. You know, what's the first rule of CrossFit? You always talk about CrossFit. That's how my analyst is. So I've been, I've been learning to turn him down and feel first. Trust my gut brain, trust my gut, go into those things. And my analyst says, you made a store in 2020 to 2021 because I made an online store that I've been meaning to do for a long time. You offered coaching. You started Church of Wild. You did all these things to make money. Why aren't you making an income? And, and he also says, and you haven't really worked it, which is totally true. I haven't worked it as though it were like a storefront. So you will be seeing some changes. In fact, here. These are my leggings. <laughs> so that's one style. Um, Cause I put my photography on leggings for the most part. Although I'm coming out with some hoodie sets and uh, some other stuff for spring soon. But you know, it's like, why, why haven't I made an income? And part of it, most of it is really because I, I have not felt free enough to talk about it. So there's that. But there's also, I need to make a fucking income. And so I'm looking for a job. And, and part of me, I found, I found, I'm, I'm actually looking at this company that's right up my alley and I'll tell you about it at some point, you know, wish me luck this week. But, um, it's taken me a really long time to get my resume done. Uh, and and think about how my, my analyst self, my, I don't know what other selves, they kind of want to stay, they kind of want to stay in this, this cocoon of pine that is my house, right? The pandemic, it's, it's been a, it's been like the wind in a way, roiling and disturbing. But it's also been like getting out of the wind, trying to find a place to hunker down and survive. And who knows if we're going to have like a umpteenth wave because of this other, this new guy, this new, pan, this new variant. But I also feel very... You know, I feel pretty safe in my own home, as many of you probably have experienced as well. And and yet I'm ready to like break out and get out into the sunshine and and meet people. And if I have to wear a mask, fine. You know, um, as I've said before, I I have people in my family that that would not do well if they really got a, a bad case of it. And so I'm extra careful but it has been kind of like both the wind in being unsettling and disturbing and relentless. But I'm kind of ready to see the blessings of the wind. Maybe not the blessings of the pandemic, although 
There are those. It's, it's pushed many of us, right? But I can see the blessings of the wind today. I can see those. And I invite you, I guess. I invite you to think about the blessings of the wind. Scientifically, literally, as we walk outside our homes and we see the treetops blowing, or we almost get blown over by a 40 mile an hour gust, you know, maybe we can see it as circulatory instead of an attack. Doesn't have to be war, right? Um, yes, so um, I can't, I was gonna comment. I can't find it. Okay, um, second thing, speaking of war. Speaking of war, um, and war, I think, is a less accurate than invasion. Um, there is a market in Colorado Springs called Euro Market. They are Ukrainian. They are supporting the Ukrainian people with donations. And I wish that you would go there and buy things and put cash in the jar next to the cash register to send directly to people in need. They have Stop Putin stop sign stickers. Um, I gave them all to my family. I'm going to go back this week and get, get another one um, that you can buy for like $2.50 and, or anything and, and slap it on your computer or your water bottle or on the underside of Alfonso's Tacos thing or on the Dutch Brothers pole of the drive through restaurants you go through. Um, this is for people in Colorado Springs. I encourage you who are not here to seek out places that are are supporting um, Ukraine in your city. There, I have an opinion. It's unequivocal. What's happening over there is devastating and wrong. And I'm not going to talk the whole time about this, but yeah. Um, so please do that. And I will post a link to Euro Market so that you can find it. It's on Academy just north of Austin Bluffs. So I'm, today is a little bit of a hodgepodge. Um, I just feel like telling you some stories. This is not a long story, but let's see, I have some, so there's this. It's 4711. And then I found this one time, um, this, oh yeah, I should show you that. This is actually, <laughs> Um, talc powder. So again, 4711. And this is like a super old, probably from the 50s, um, talc powder. I'm not going to open it because it will go everywhere and talc is bad for you. Don't use that shit, man. No, I'm totally opening it. I said I wasn't going to open it. This week, um, yesterday, when I went to the Ukrainian store, they have these, um, they have these canned, they have tons of canned food that is not American and fun. And I, I took my eight, my 19 year old son to it because I wanted him to give, get a little taste of Europe. And, uh, and there's just tons of like, I bought Sprats. Pate sprats are apparently a kind of fish. I don't know. I don't know what it tastes like right now. Okay. It's really bad, but I'm I'm gonna close it. <laughs> um, 47 And then here is the bottle. I found this bottle in a in a an antique store one time. I use it all the time. I lost the cap just a day or two ago, so I've been covering it. So this is the really old label. 
And then this is even older. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sorry. I tangented out of a story. I was at the Ukraine store. I'll just hold this up. I was at the Ukraine store and they have these um, canned foods and one of them is army pork. And okay, I'm not, I don't have people in the military, so I don't know what this stuff is. And it sounded good. It sounded like a pork dinner, right? So I was just super curious about what it would taste like. And when I took my son back to his dad's afterwards, I opened that in, in my ex's house. And he was really mad for a minute. Not like actually mad, but like, why did you open that in my house? Because it kind of smelled like really nice cat food. But I did bring it here and I tasted it. And it wasn't bad. It tasted like roast pork. I don't care. I'll eat whatever. I mean, I'm picky if I'm going to pay. I don't know. I guess if I'm at a restaurant, right? But canned foods, you get a little bit of a <laughs> pass. It was pretty fascinating tasting. I ate, I haven't eaten much more. And I did give some to my cat. She was meowing. So she didn't eat all of it. Okay, skip forward to story. These, newer bottle. Older bottle. This is the oldest bottle. And I got this from my mom. Um, 4711 uh, is a perfume. And the story that my mom would tell is that the guy that she dated before she dated my father, and by dated, I mean, we mean went out with. Um, she lived in Mishawaka, Indiana. And one of you, somebody else is from Mishawaka that I know. So cheers to Mishawaka. And she met him. I have no idea how she met him. Maybe at work. But she was 22, 3. Um, because she had me when she was, I think, 25. And so it was like right before she met my dad or agreed to marry him. And she dated this man who was a test driver for a Volkswagen in the United States. He was German and he would take her on rides in his Volkswagen that had heated seats and a heater in the, in the vehicle so that it would keep it warm while you were in the store or the restaurant or whatever. Um, Let's see, my mom was born in 1945, so this had to be like in the early 60s. And he gave her this very bottle. His name was Carl. He gave her this very bottle of perfume, I think for her birthday or just a present. And she used to say, <laughs> in her funny way, she used to say, I almost married that man, and so he would have been your father <laughs> if I had married him. Um, what's cool about this, this fragrance is that it's actually French, I think. I'm so sorry. It's not French. It's German. But it was the first, um, non-gendered perfume, uh, you know, that became really prominent and famous. And Napoleon of, of France used to bathe in water that made up with tons of this stuff in it because it has this lemony, um, very, very fresh smell. I have a couple of perfumers as friends, uh, and maybe they could probably tell me, I know they could tell me what elements make up 4711 because it's a very old, old fragrance. And uh, I still wear it. I'm wearing it right now. I take it on trips with me because it's almost like a, it's kind of like a deodorant without being a deodorant. Anyway, 
I always loved how my mom would say, she would, he would have been your father if I hadn't, if I had kept dating him and he wanted me to come back to Germany with him and I didn't go because of, I was scared. I don't know if she said scared. But there was an element of that, right? Staying where you're comfortable. She stayed where she was comfortable. And my mom had a, had a wanderlust bug as big as I do and she didn't really get to indulge it until much, much too late. Um, I could tell that she regretted maybe not going to Germany in ways. I know she was glad she had us, but yeah, you know, the road not taken. <laughs> okay, so that's 4711. Um, the other thing I want to do today is another reading, actually, because I'm always fascinated by books that stand the test of time, and there are, you know, millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands of books, maybe thousands of books that people still refer to, across cultures, um, not, not just Western. So I'm going to read a little bit from Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. And I did the, I don't, I read this sometimes to disagree with it. Hi, Joe Carol. Okay. Here's a little reading. Now this is part of chapter 10. And part 13. No, part 12. Oh, yeah, okay. What need is there of suspicious fear? Since it is in your power to inquire what ought to be done. And if all is clear, go forward content without turning back. But if all is not clear, stop and take the best of counsel. But if anything, other things oppose you, go on according to your powers with due consideration, keeping to that which appears just. For it is best to aim at this, and if you fail, let your failure be in making this attempt. He who follows reason in all things is both tranquil and active at the same time, and also cheerful and collected. It's really funny because he completely contradicts himself. Now, I I have not read the original language. Um, however, what does he mean by if all is clear? So he's saying what need is there of suspicious fear? And if you don't have any, then you can go forward content without turning back. But if it's not clear, stop. But then at the very end, he says, he who follows reason in all things is both tranquil and active. So he's saying, um, feel your feelings, feel fear, feel the lack of fear, uh, pay attention to your gut, pay attention to your feelings, use that to move forward or stop and take counsel, but only use reason to move forward. That makes no sense to me. That is how our world is today. Still, like think through things, do research compare all the rates, compare all the prices. And yet, don't you dare cry when asking for a raise. Uh, strength is by showing is shown by no emotion. It's a muddle. It's a crazy contradictory, cognitive dissonant, cognitively dissonant muddle. And when was Marcus Aurelius's meditations written? 
how long have we been doing this? We ignore our gut brain. Okay, gut brain. It is called the enteric, enteric nervous system. E E E N T E R I C nervous system. Seems we're talking about circulatory and nervous systems today. The enteric nervous system is the literal brain material kind of bundles that that wraps itself in and around your digestive system down here in your gut. And it commute and it is the same stuff that's in your in your cranium. It is a brain. It is part of your brain, our brains. But it doesn't live here. It lives in our guts. And so it, it communicates up the spine with the head brain. They're not separate. They're the same thing, but they're also symbiotic, right? And so they think that when they kind of discovered this material, that is where we get the concept of gut feeling and gut instincts. When someone says that your hunch is worth less than your analysis, coming back to how I have to turn off my inner, my brain analyst and listen to my gut, it's just as validly a brain function listening to your gut and and hunches as is something that is pure logic or analysis. And recent research has been showing since like the 40s that that you that things that we do impact that area, right? And so and so it goes both ways. And this is kind of really hard to talk about because, you know, when you don't know something, you don't know something and you can't, you know, we all do stuff that harms, like it, you know, it's not the best, it's not the best thing. And, and so I think back, right? I think back to eating habits, say, or or habits of, of my body. Um, and because it goes both ways. What, what we put in our system, in our digestive system, actually does impact that gut brain function. It's not just cut and dry, like the organs of some, you know, plastic animal. <laughs> Um, they all interact. And so, um, like eating, a eating 30 plus different kinds of fruits and vegetables over the course of a week and, and eating as much variety is shown to build your micro, um, microbiota, like your, your gut colonies of, you know, our, our symbiotes, the gut colonies of bacteria and all that stuff microorganisms and when when we have problems there it impacts that brain and so if you think about how that plays out in everyday life we're less capable of hearing our gut instincts and then think of what that ends up doing like the kinds of decisions that we make that you know maybe after making a decision we're like why did I choose that that was so harmful to myself or you know, all of those kinds of regrets. But then they've also shown that like intense emotion, like um, chronic trauma, unprocessed trauma, all of those things impact it as well. We are whole beings and the gut brain, the enteric nervous system, ENT, is a perfect example because it goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, what we eat impacts the gut brain, the gut brain impacts what we eat, and then it all impacts how we think and feel. And I am categorically against the predominance of logic 
in our world. Even as my, hab my habitual response to things is to problem solve, break it down logically, analyze it, figure out how to fix it, figure out how to do things, okay? But I have been trying to get better at going from my gut. I'm actually writing about this in this, um, in a new book called Put Down the Whip. <laughs> it's a book about discipline and making peace with discipline. And, uh, you know, there, and this is also, I'm also putting it into this course, which, like I said in the beginning, I'm doing all these things and I am going to start talking about them more as though they were a storefront, the storefront of Janae. <laughs> um, and just about how to train our gut instincts in kind of an everyday way to be heard and to be strengthened, right? Um, so Marcus Aurelius, thank you for showing us that, man, this has been going on a long time. Sometimes what he says is just so obvious, but also practical. I'm going to read the next one. 13. Inquire of yourself as soon as you awaken from sleep, whether it will make any difference to you if another, if another does what is just and right. It will make no difference. <laughs> Have you forgotten that those who assume arrogant airs in bestowing of their praise or blame on others are the same in bed and at table? Have you forgotten what it is they per pursue and avoid, how they steal, not with hands and feet, but with their most valuable part, by means of which, if a man chooses, he arrives at fidelity, modesty, truth, and law? Have you forgotten? But I love when the first thing you do in the morning, think about whether it'll make any difference to you if somebody else is doing what's right and just. Okay, privileged white man. <laughs> Yes. Yes, it does make a difference. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't make a difference as you walk from your bedroom to the coffee in the morning. But you know what? Here's the thing. Our world is so interconnected now. It's so different, right? Because it actually kind of does make a difference. Like where we buy our coffee and crap. Like, like there are actually people being abused right this very second in fields all over this world in order to bring me in order to bring me some of the things that are in my kitchen For a long time, because I have never been someone who could just spend whatever I wanted on things, I do it now too. Not as much. But when you don't have enough money to feel stable, you can excuse, I can excuse where things come from, how they're made, who made them, whose hands were on these things. Maybe this is the preachiest part of today because I'm feeling very convicted to physically and literally go through every single ingredient in my pantry, refrigerator, and kitchen and by pantry, I mean cupboard. <laughs> and make sure that the people who packaged it, the people who harvested it, and the people who processed it, packaged it, and sent it are not in pain because I want that thing. I have ignored that. I try to buy things with the, like the certifications. 
you know, of free trade and organic because that's how I've eaten most of my, like most of my adult life. And, but I haven't paid as much attention. I've only thought of it from my point of view. Is this good for my body? Not thinking about the bodies that made it and the hands that made it. And here Marcus Aurelius kind of is talking about that. He says, of course, why should you care? Now, I think maybe he thinks of it more in terms of gossip or people attacking you or whatever, which I feel that part of the reason I haven't spoken up about all of my stuff is because I get kind of scared of being seen ironically. That's why I'm here is really to share and hope that something that comes out of my mouth improves your life as audacious and arrogant as that might seem but also to to put feet to the belief that that my life is worth itself and thus it's fine to be seen right and so I'm having like a spiritual experience here on camera, I guess, because I don't, I don't want to put things in my body in, in food and drink that, that have caused people pain. If I have to pay a little bit more, a little bit extra for something that I really like in order to get a version of it that doesn't cause harm, then I'll go without it or I'll have it far less often, right? Maybe that's where the rubber hits the road, is really realizing that the person who harvested, processed, or packaged this thing is a person too, and that we all are absolutely one people. On the quantum physics day, I talked about how at the deepest level, there's no difference between this thing, glass, tissue, wood, uh, what else? Peppermint tea. There's no difference at the deepest levels between them and us. If you look deep enough, we're just quantum particles bouncing against each other with no time we're all events. This is an event in space time. This is an event. You are an event. And if you are an event and I am an event, then the people who harvested, processed and packaged things, they are too. And I can't morally justify it saying, well, they're far away and I'm poor. So I'm going to, I'm going to pay for the cheapest version of this thing. I think I'd rather just eat beans and cornbread every day than, than fuel and energize my body with things that are soaked in pain. And I'll post a photo. I'm not gonna move the camera around because it's dang hard to get it to stand in the right place. But I'll post a photo of my spice, my spice wall kind of over there. I like, I like all kinds of stuff from all kinds of places. And I am pledging to you today on a Sunday, as my mom would always say, now don't cuss or be mean on Sunday. It's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. <laughs> and I would always respond, what makes it any different? Do you mean we can do all those things on the days that aren't Sunday? <laughs> but for you and I, this is when we meet, right? So I pledge to you on a Sunday that I'm going to begin probably a pretty long task 
of figuring out if what I have in my cupboards and my fridge are from places that cause pain to people. It sounds like a nice accidental project, doesn't it? But I'm just gonna do it. I don't need to make a project out of it. <laughs> okay, cheers. Shaking hands with you to do that. And, ooh, excuse me. Um, I'm gonna read our invocation again because it was that good. And next week, I'm gonna talk about something more like about Christianity stuff. Um, I ran into this, you know how you run into memes or screenshots of tweets. And I found this Nazarene pastor. Um, my dad was a Nazarene pastor, so I grew up in that church. Nazarene pastor who is saying a lot of stuff I agree with, which is amazing. Probably he's in danger of getting kicked out, but we'll see. And I'm going to check out his stuff. And I think I'd like to talk about that kind of stuff next week. I'm, I will even do a him hacker. Okay. This is going to be where I go through and talk about a him. Good morning, John. I'm reading the, the, um, uh, what's the opposite of, oh God, what is it again? What's the, hey John, what's the opposite of invocation? The thing that you read at the end. There's a ton of them in my hymnal. Oh, well. Um. I don't remember. Oh, benediction. <laughs> Good morning, Sharon. I hope you guys will watch the replay. I'm kind of at the end. And so I'm actually about to read the invocation as the benediction for today, because it was just that profound and very timely for Colorado this week. Okay. Where to put it? All right. Glasses. Good morning. <laughs> okay. I can see, even though they're really dirty. Okay. This is by Lyle Watson. Blessed be the wind. Without wind, most of Earth would be uninhabitable. The tropics would grow so unbearably hot that nothing could live there and the rest of the planet would freeze. Moisture, if any existed, would be confined to the oceans and all but the fringe of the great continents would be desert. There would be no erosion, no soil, and for any community that managed to evolve despite these rigors, no relief from suffocation by their own waste products. But with the wind, earth comes truly alive. Winds provide the circulatory and nervous systems of the planet, sharing out energy and information, distributing both warmth and awareness, making something out of nothing. All the wind's properties are borrowed. Our knowledge of it comes at second hand, but it comes strongly. And this combination of a force that cannot be ap apprehended, but nevertheless has an undeniable existence, remind you of anything these days? And this combination of a force that cannot be apprehended, but nevertheless has an undeniable existence was our first experience of the spiritual. A crack in the cosmos, 
that widened to let the tide of consciousness flow through. We are the fruits of the wind and have been seeded, irrigated, and cultivated by its craft. Dang o -rama. So as the winds pick up across Colorado and probably across the United States this week, I hope that when you walk in the wind, drive in the wind, that you think about how we are fruits of the wind and how the roiling can bring life. Happy Sunday to you. Okay. It's been great being here with you today and talking about some things. I look forward to seeing you more. I really am trying to start the Wednesdays. Uh, what am I calling them? Oh, yeah. Work it out Wednesdays. Wow. <laughs> W-I-O-W. And uh, it is going to be a meetup on Zoom scheduled for no more than like just over half an hour and it is going to be where you bring a roadblock a dream um, or a goal that has something in it that you can't figure out and you need to define that okay and then we meet up and we try to meet each other's needs for whatever it is and I will tell, I'll tell another story um, in the promo things for that. But if you want to think about a time in your life where it has been moved forward because of an accident or a connection, um, an accidental connection, an unforeseen circumstance, then that's kind of what what this will be, except doing so through connection um, and intent, intentional connection. So there's that. Um, earlier, I shared an epiphany about all the things that I have made and the ideas I have and the things I have going. Um, I was talking with my friend Evelyn Steele. She's a coach. She was my friend like ages and as I built my Yoni Flower Collections store during the pandemic, um, she built her coaching business. And so we kind of have been helping each other through all these um, months to build a business and make graphics and copy words and all kinds of things. And we were speaking this week and she said, um, and I was talking about how I felt a lot of guilt because I have said that I want to create an income with my own stuff. But I haven't, I haven't really talked about it a whole lot. And then I said, yeah, when I, when I was running the bookstore or the hang, I was working at the hang gliding place, um, you know, a storefront, I feel fine talking about working at a store. Nourish, when I worked at Nourish Organic Juice, which is what she owned, that's, we, we worked together there too. I was fine with posting a, posting for you guys about all of that, but I feel like I'm bugging people by telling them about my leggings store, you know? And I realized that that's, that's cognitive dissonance. That's, that's a lie to myself. And so um, I am, as I share amazing things, just like normal on my Facebook page, writing things, I'm also going to start sharing things as though this is the storefront of Janae, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, I will give you one last story for this week, even though I'm a little late. Okay, here. Now, let's see if we can see them. It's upside down. Okay, wait. Uh, anyway, those are leggings. And the photo um, that makes up the sort of plaid herringbone sort of pattern on these is of the shrine to Joan of Arc in Notre Dame in Paris before the fire. I was there in 2016, and the shrine to her was amazing. They had candles. You could, you could light a candle to Jeanne of Arc. Jeanne d'Arc. Jeanne of Arc. There was a, there was a blank um, 
a book with blank pages and you could write messages to women in your life or to Joan of Arc. And I inscribed the names of strong women, my mother, and strong women in my life. Um, I had lost a, a really dear friend, um, Maida, just a couple of months before. And I wrote her name in the book of Joan of Arc. And I'm pretty sure that the shrine was probably burned. I don't, I don't know the status of it. But this photo in this pattern is from that before the fire. And it, they're really special to me. Um, I feel stronger. I feel like I invoke the spirit of Joan of Arc when I wear them. And um, I chose like a, a print on demand company, a manufacturer to, so that I wouldn't, my fashion wouldn't be wasteful. They're higher quality. They're a little bit more expensive. They're not cheap like Walmart leggings. I can't really afford to buy my own leggings, like tons and tons of pairs, but I feel like, I don't really want you to buy tons and tons of pairs, at least all at once. I want you to, I want people to buy one and wear them and, and know that they're of quality, right? Oh, so I'm talking about my stuff, but yeah, um, it's special. It's important to me. And uh, I hope you will talk about the things that you do. And thank you for just even, just even being here. So helping me to get out into the wind of the world instead of saying hunker down in the cave of, of my little pine house. Hello, pine. And, um, and I hope that you have a lovely, you have a lovely week. Okay. Ciao. Adios. Awkward time. Awkward dance. As I, I wish I could get my cat out so you could just watch her. <laughs>